Welcome again, saints. I am your dearest, dearest servant, uh, Brother Pastor Dale from St. Mark uh, Baptist Church right here, uh, live from Sanctuary in Waterloo, Iowa. And today is March 12th, uh, Lesson 2, uh, The Greatest Kingdom for Our Standard International Lesson Students. And the devotional reading today is Matthew 19, 13 through 22. In the background scriptures, Matthew 18, 1 through 9, and Mark 10, 15. And in the today's scriptures, Matthew 18, uh, 1 through 9. And the measure of greatness, Matthew 18, 1 through 5, says, At that time, uh, at that time, the disciples came and Jesus asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them and said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like this little children, you will never enter into the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of a child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whosoever welcomes one such child in my name, welcomes me. So when we talk about the greatest uh, in the kingdom of heaven, we know that uh, Jesus had other things to say about this same subject uh, because even over, I believe it's the gospel of John, Jesus was talking and he said, you know, his type was talking about who was going to be next to him and the greatest in this. And Jesus said, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. So when we talk about the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, we, we have to realize uh, that the greatest person in the kingdom of heaven uh, is going to be the servant and those who vows lowest before people because those are the ones that are putting people before themselves, right? The great, and if, if I could just bring it even to a leadership perspective, when we talk about the greatest in the kingdom of heaven uh, today, a uh, standard lesson students is this, is that a lot of times, especially in these places, in these buildings, we tend to have this hierarchical structure about uh, with respect to who's more important than the other, who should be given more honor and tribute than the other, right? And that is just, that is so, it's just unbiblical saints. There's no other way to come at that, but to tell you how unbiblical that is. And, and I use like myself uh, as, as, as a church leader, as a church pastor, is that many people believe and they treat me as if I'm some kind of quasi celebrity, right? Or something like this. Uh, because I told you, I told you uh, all a few weeks back, and I want to remind you, I went to a church to drop a letter off uh, for the pastor there. And when I came through the door, the 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 usher, the person at the door, I uh, was like, "Can I help you?" Like, and you know, you, you know how that goes. And I said, "Yeah, I, I'm dropping this off. Can you, you give this to Brother Pastor?" And they're like, "Yeah, yeah, 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 sure." And they said, uh, "Who shall I say is telling, uh, send, uh, giving this?" I said, "Yeah." I said, yeah, I'm uh, Pastor Dale from up there at St. Mark. Oh, hey, Pastor. Did, did, did. You know, this sort of thing, just putting on that church facade. So I, I'm saying that to say this, saints, is that the person who walks through the door, who may not have great church clothes, who may look lost, who may uh, not be wearing the right things, saying the right things, they are, the Lord loves them as much as anyone else. Nobody has been able to biblically, from a Christian apologetic standpoint, even philosophically, uh, tell me or uh, not even in a satisfactory way, they just haven't been able to put a cogent case together to say that leaders in the church are thought more of, loved more, more special to God, more favored uh, by God than anyone else. That is not the truth. The reality is that we are not more loved and favored, but we are more accountable for what he has given us. Take chart. We know what uh, 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 the Bible says about uh, being obedient to those who have washed our souls. So we should give account that we should do it with a joy and not grief, et cetera, et cetera. We are more accountable. But I said that to point out that we even we put these silos up and we want to elevate some and deplatform the others and saints, the greatest in the kingdom of God, as this says right there, has to come to Jesus totally open, has to come to Jesus humble, has to come to Jesus knowing that they don't know anything. To the next sets of scripture, saints, is that my, my granddaughter, she's eight now, and she listen, listen, listen. The next thing I know, you know, six or seven, she's walking up to me, telling me and preaching to me about Jesus, right? She comes to church with us, preaching about Jesus. And I said, I said to her, I said, do you, do you love Jesus? Yes. Do you believe Jesus died for the bad things you did? Yes. I said, but you've never seen him. You don't even know if he's real. She, and, and she said this. It was so beautiful, elegant. She said, I don't have to know. I just, 
I, I just think he is, you know, believe. I just think he is. I don't have to know. I just believe Jesus. And it's that simple, right? And this is what Jesus is, is, is talking about. Uh, the greatest in the kingdom of heaven has to come to him like a child, has to come open, has to come realizing they are no better than anybody else, has to come to him in a way uh, that says, Lord, you own everything. In the beginning was the word, the word was God, the word was God. Sims also beginning with God, all things were created by him and for him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Lord, you own everything anyway, Lord. My life is yours. They have to come we're doing what the scripture says, presenting himself as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable, and blameless, which is your reasonable service. And I'll just read a couple of these explanations, these exegetes. Jesus, uh, and this is one, had been teaching on the practice of kings of the earth. Although he was not teaching regarding God's kingdom, his disciples began considering at that time their own position in the promised kingdom. The 12 disciples had been urging uh, regarding who from among them would be the greatest, and that was uh, Luke. Uh, their uh, discussions and arguments regarding their position continue, even as they shared the last meal with Jesus before his arrest. If the Messiah were to rule in the same manner on earthly rules, then he would require positions of lesser authority in his kingdom. The disciples assumed they would fill such roles. Jesus did not answer the disciples' question directly. Now, I'll, I'll, I'm going to finish there before I move on to the next set of texts. Saints, one thing that I don't want you to miss throughout the, uh, especially with the God, well, with the Gospels, is that Jesus, oftentimes, people would ask Jesus a question and he would like not answer it. He would just say something else. Because what he was teaching us now is that we have to learn to ask the God questions, not the good questions, not even the great questions, the God questions, the ones that are according to his will, right? Because when we ask the questions that are according to God's will, we are going to give an answer that's from the Holy Spirit. The greatest example that I can think of at this time anyway, in the New Testament of this is when Jesus was having that exchange with his disciples and he was saying, who does who do people say that I am? Some John the Baptist, some say Elijah. Jesus came back with, who do you say that I am? Peter came back and said, thou art Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, Simon Barjona. And then Jesus went on from there. And I, I said that to give that example. If we ask the Holy Ghost question, we get the Holy Ghost answer, right? So Jesus, when he would, when people would ask him a question, he wouldn't either answer or he'd talk about something else. That's a way of indicating that wasn't even the right question. You're not even on the right path. So I'm going to tell you what the real answer is to the question you didn't even ask <laughs> or you were supposed to ask. So when you go to God, saints, we can't go assuming that we have it all down, that we have it all together, that we have it all in a place where we think we need to know what to ask God. Uh, for instance, a uh, God. What should I be doing right now in ministry? That's not the right question. You ain't got the answer because it's not the right question. The right question is, who are, who are you? Who are you? What is your name on that stone? Fear, love, joy, warrior. What is that white stone, the revelation white stone? The same one Jesus changed uh, on earth when Jesus changed uh, Simon's name to Peter, meaning rock. Remember, I told you, I told you all about students about that. We know that that was Peter's white stone from revelation, one of the few instances we have in the book of somebody receiving their white stone, the revelations, white stone, revealing their name, their real identity, uh, while they were yet living was Peter. And we know that because that same conversation I told you about uh, P Jesus between Jesus and Peter, Jesus said this, he, he went and said on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Not on Peter, but on the rock of the confession from a rock named Peter. Oh, that's how we know. So what I'm saying, saints, is you have to ask God your true identity because the reality is the greatest in the kingdom or the least in the kingdom, whatever that thing is, you have to have your identity. Asking God what you should be doing in the season is not the right question. The question is, who am I? Once you know who you are, and let me tell you this as well. Most of you who see this, I don't know you. I'll probably never meet you. Most of you don't even know your real identity and your real name in Jesus because you don't even know enough to ask. And I'm not saying that in a condescending manner. I'm saying that because as a preacher of the gospel called in 1997, right? Preached my trial sermon in 2003. And here I am 20 years later, a pastoring. 
leading a congregation. We'll see how long that lasts. But what I'm saying here is I didn't even know enough to ask him that necessarily until about 10 years ago. And the reason I asked him, and I want to share this testimony with you. The reason I asked the Lord, because my pastor, he was, and, and I if or reasonably understand his word a little bit. My pastor kept coming at me and he was like trying to make me into him. You got to do this. You got to do that. Uh, you got to let it. He was trying to make me into a lamb like him when God created me to be a Joshua, a warrior, a voice crying in the wilderness. However you want to frame that. He was trying to make me into him. And I began to get hostile with him. And he and I, you know, we, we had disagreements. And I told my I told my leader, I'm not you. I don't want to look like you. I don't want to preach like you. I don't sound like you. I had to get that bold with him because what I what I realized is you, most of us have had our identities in God beat out of us, cussed out of us, medicated out of us, tricked out of us, extracted out of us, even by well-meaning church leaders like my pastor. He's God's man. He's just he was just confused and I had to set him straight. And most of us don't have, you don't have the boldness to step up to God's man like that and tell him what's up because you think you're going to go to hell and you standing against God's anointing for speaking the God, the God, the, the Holy Ghost truth to him. That's a life in the pit of hell. We'll, we'll deal with that some other time. Nobody, nobody's above being confronted. Me, read chap, Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 17. Ain't nobody above the word of God is the greatest in the kingdom of God, which is our lesson title today, saints has to begin with salvation. And when you get into that sanctification of the discipleship process, you got to ask him who you are and then what you should be doing will become obvious. And sometimes you literally got to struggle in the spirit against people that are well-meaning to maintain your Christian identity, your white stone. Amen. Warning of sin, Matthew 18, six through nine. If anyone causes one of the little ones who those who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their necks and be drowned in death. See, Jesus says, better you commit suicide. That's what he's saying. Woe or sorrow to the world because of the things which uh, people, which cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the persons through whom they come. If your hands or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter a uh, life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life uh, with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fires of uh, hell. And what that has to do with our topic of the greatest in the kingdom today, saints, when we talk about uh, first shall be last, last shall be first, and we understand uh, this, I mean, contextually, we understand that people that are even in the kingdom of God are always examining themselves, self-examining. Am I following too much with my eyes see instead of what my spirit may not see? But no, that's called faith. The substance things hope for the evidence of things not seen. I trust off. I trust more in things I do not see than things I can see. That's that's just why I'm not saying I'm a great man of faith. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying, and I'm not saying everything around me is an illusion or we're in the matrix or some of that nonsense. That's not what I'm saying, right? What I am saying is, saints, I know that there has to be somewhere better than here. There has to be somewhere better than here. And when Jesus was talking about stumbling these little ones, it would be better for somebody uh, to commit suicide than stumble these little ones. We have to understand, uh, saints, that we hold this, we, that is a stark warning against being a stumbling block of, of, of negative offense for somebody. And as I explained to you before, being a stumbling block is not a bad thing. Being a stumbling block to keep somebody away from Jesus, that is. And, and I use an example, the, the best one I could find anyway, is here in, here in Iowa, um, when you go in school zones, it, well, in better neighborhoods anyway, let me put it like that. When you go in school in better neighborhoods, when you go in front of the school, there's these bumps that if you don't slow down, boom, boom, you're gonna ruin your car. And those things are meant to slow you down, to get you to pay attention and to let you know this is dang What you're doing is dangerous if you're speeding. So when we as believers serve that kind of of that kind of function to slow somebody down or to stop them or to even destroy the undercarriage in their life to keep them from something much worse, running over a child in the spirit, if you understand what I'm saying. That's a beautiful thing. So don't even I tell you, being stumbling blocks is a bad thing. It is not a bad thing. Because, and I know that 
Because how many of you have raised children and or grandchildren and you have kept them? You have literally stood in their way from them making the worst decision of their lives. You stop them. Right now, when we talk about stumbling away from Jesus, the, the, the contextual, the, the context here is simple, is that when we look at this, Jesus is talking about that kind of stumbling away from him. That's keeping people from him. For instance, for instance, when he goes down and saying, when he's saying all of these things that you better, it's better you pluck your eye out. It's better to cut, cut parts of your body off. What Jesus is saying is if you stumble somebody, you, you might as well get ready to be thrown into the fires of hell. So whatever that is, that's keeping you, uh, that's, that's causing you to appear as a stumbling block to others. You need to deal with that in your life. Cut that thing out, throw that thing away so that people can see you little children in the spirit. We can say in the spirit, keep, cut that thing, keep, get that thing out of your life. And the way we do that is for, through repentance. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And the other part of that, uh, saints is this is when we talk about that, uh, people watching us, remember we ain't, we ain't kids. We're supposed to be grown ups. But first, John, you remember the writer referred to the adults that he was writing to. He says, you little children. So in the chill, in the spirit, we are children. So this has bigger applicability than just physical children. I want us to grab a hold of that. So if you are going to stumble somebody, make sure just like with our children, our loved ones, Make sure we're just trying to make sure it's we're going to stand in your way and we're going to stand in your way of doing this wrong thing. And if you fall down in the spirit and get injured in the spirit or stumble and fall uh, and hit the ground and it's that pain that causes you to get back up and heal and turn around. I'm going to be that bump in front of the school in your life. Amen. The subject six, eight, and this is a description. The subject of this verse, anyone is a parallel to you of Matthew. Jesus continue with the universal applicability teaching. The phrase causes a stumble translates a Greek word from which we derive our word scandal. If can, it can refer to something that causes a person to trip as in stumbling block. However, it can also refer to something more serious than obstacle that breaks fellowship and causes sin. But again, that is what he's talking about here. But we are, we are also always again to serve as bulwarks against people walking off the cliff. Now, here's the difference. And this is something I had to learn in my own life, Sunday school students, as we close here. We cannot uh, be the Bible police. I had to be broken of that. I got broken of that in the last few months. You know, I want to stop people, pull them over in the spirit and say, you were going too fast. You're out of order. You're breaking the law. I want to give them a ticket, make them show up to court. And I want to be on the bench serving as judge, jury, and executioner trying to enforce the law, the Bible. That's not our place. Someone, uh, 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 my uh, teacher reminded me is that just as the Bible says, if if they won't hear you, kick the dust off your sandals as a witness against them, because it shall be more tolerable for the, those leaders that I've warned. It should be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than they. So when Jesus is talking about this, and I'm going to read the rest of it. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus used the phrase little ones when speaking of his followers. Two possibilities is this regarding the identity of the little ones. I'm not even going to read that because possibilities is inserting something into the text that might not be there. And I believe that that's inappropriate, so I'm not going to go there. But what I will say, saints, is it is a beautiful thing as I close here. Uh, standard lesson students to serve as a roadblock to somebody committing evil. You and I would not even be here if somebody didn't love us enough to be that roadblock or to uh, stand in the way of us running to something, trip us, put their leg, put their spiritual foot out. We run into evil, run into death, run into jail. And, and my mom or somebody in the spirit stuck their foot out and we fell down. And while we fell and fall and while, while we're falling down, they're injured and we're crying about the wounds. Mama's sitting there talking you know, talking, you know, talking to us saying, I told you not to do that. This is going to happen if you go there. And then <laughs> y'all remember crying. Right. And you remember there was no time that we as children, we were more contemplative than when we were crying and we just got a whoop it. There's nothing wrong with standing as a roadblock or a bulwark against evil. But saints, for those of you who are doing evil in church, doing evil in the congregation, you need to repent. You need to turn. 
because somebody's watching you, a little child, a little a person that's new to the faith or might be considering coming to the faith. The spirit has drawn them. Jesus said it right here. It is better that you commit suicide than that you stumble somebody that's looking to him and that you that your actions is going to keep him, keep these new people from him. That's the bad kind of stumbling block that Jesus was referring to. Amen.